Welcome everybody. I'm delighted that you're here tonight on and the weather, the terrible weather to be here. Uh, my name is Steve Cohen. Uh, I'm the outgoing exec executive director of the Earth Institute and a professor here at Columbia and the director of the research program of sustainable sustainability policy and management. Um, Professor Bose and I, uh, along with a number of other colleagues, began this research program about five years ago. Time flies so fast when you're having a good time. And we've already produced, I think, some pretty interesting uh, work in sustainability metrics, policy, education, management, and finance. Um, in fact, Professor Bose and Professor Gua Don will soon be publishing a path-breaking book in sustainability science, uh, finance, rather, which I'm looking forward to reading uh, in its fully published form, uh, which I know will be coming out in November. In the fall. In the fall. Okay, so December. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a little bit about this research program and Professor Bose, and then he's going to come up and introduce the panel and its participants. Uh, one of the things that uh, that I'm really interested in focusing on uh, now that I won't be doing as much administration uh, is in working with Professor Bose and, and my other colleagues to build this research program uh, in sustainability uh, policy and management. I direct the MPA in sustainability management, uh, the MPA in environmental science and policy, and the MS in sustainability management here at Columbia. And these are two programs uh, that are really cutting edge but we sometimes depend on research that's not that cutting edge. Uh, we depend on uh, work that, uh, in my view, needs improvement, and so that's part of why we've begun to do this. Uh, in fact, I'm hoping that over time we will uh, build this research program into a research center uh, here at Columbia. But the work in sustainability management and finance is so central uh, to the transition to a renewable resource based economy that we really need a stronger research base than we have today. And we've been inventing this field on the fly and we're motivated by our sense of urgency um, and uh, the mission that we have in our programs. But as academics, we know we need to undertake a more intensive study and research to ensure that what we teach in the classroom is based more on more than folklore and our recent experience as practitioners uh, and on world-class research. Um, and we know how to do that uh, and we're going to, and we've begun to do that already in this program. And if any of you agree and if you happen to be very wealthy or if you know wealthy people, uh, our donation window is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we're raising money for projects, researchers, field costs, computers, toner, you name it. Uh, there are opportunities to name scholarships, faculty, park benches, uh, even the whole research center. So we're, we're out there uh, trying to raise resources for this. But enough of the shameless self-promotion. Uh, let's turn to tonight's event, uh, which I'm pleased to welcome you to. It's called Collaborative Ecosystems in Sustainable Financing, Harnessing the Wisdom of Crowds. We're seeing growing attention being paid to the term sustainable finance. It's really been one of the uh, surprises for me in developing the sustainability management program, how important uh, the world of finance is to uh, the practice of sustainability and to our students. And it's happening here at Columbia and it's slowly making its way down to Wall Street. Uh, financial markets are the primary directors of investment and economic activity in a global capitalist society. but. They also have an important societal role of channeling capital to investment opportunities that are beneficial to natural and human systems. Now, I am uh, the son of an accountant, the brother, nephew, and brother-in-law of CPAs. Uh, I hear about finance at Thanksgiving dinner. I hear about finance all the time. Sometimes I wish I heard less about it. But uh, I know that behavior is influenced by the availability and price of capital finance. And sustainability factors have to be reflected in the world as understood by finance professionals if sustainability is to become real and not just symbolic. In our research program, we're working with the invest investment management and corporate sectors on this to highlight sources of sustainability-related risks and opportunities. Um, and I see a growing interest in this. Uh, when I speak at orientation for my students in the two master's programs I run, I tell incoming students that given the global challenges that we face, 
we need every sustainability practitioner in the room to succeed and that the culture of sustainability involves collaboration, not just competition. The collaborative ecosystems concept tonight is meant to highlight places in sustainable finance where stakeholders can collaborate and not just compete. Tonight we have a panel of experts who will explore opportunities in using crowdsourced review platforms, risk management in companies with limited financial history, and the special challenges of estimating expected returns in companies that often operate in innovative and disruptive sectors where it's not always easy to know uh, what's going to happen in the near or even the, in the long term or, or in the near term. So I'd like now to introduce my colleague and my friend, Dr. Satajit Bose, who's an economist trained here at Columbia University. He's associate director of both our research program and of the MS in Sustainability Management program. He teaches courses on the economics of sustainability, invented courses in green accounting, teaches on cost-benefit analysis, and has extensive experience in investment banking, asset management, and financial restructuring. In fact, uh, I recruited him back to Columbia when he was in the midst of that world, saying that we had a higher calling to come here and to make the world safe for sustainability finance. So, Professor Bose, please come forward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, introduce the topic and to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, the thing that I want to tell you about collaborative ecosystems and sustainable finance, harnessing the wisdom of crowds, uh, that sounds like a lot of um, buzzwords. I think the only buzzword I didn't put in there was blockchain. Um, but, um, you know, the, the idea of collaborative ecosystems, as Steve pointed out, is to examine the spaces in finance where stakeholders have to work together, um, where they collaborate rather than compete. Now, in the time that I spent in investment banking and asset management, what I noticed most was that, you know, information in that space is a valued resource. And so it tends to be hidden as much as possible. It, um, the idea is that any piece of information, however innocuous, uh, could be turned into monetary value, and so you hoard it. You know, when you go out for drinks with your closest friends who work in the business in another company, you tend not to talk about the work that you're doing. Um, and you try not to make partnerships because you don't know what you'll give away. And that culture is very different from the one that I heard, uh, you know, Professor Cohen say when I first came to this program and I listened in when he was talking to our incoming students uh, and telling them, listen, every sustainability practitioner in this room is really important to the process of meeting global sustainability challenges. We can't really compete. We have to collaborate. And so, uh, in coming up with this panel, uh, we tried to look for uh, practitioners of innovative finance platforms that operate by bringing together different stakeholders, by aggregating information, decentralized information that's uh, put out by small stakeholders, um, and uh, use that to, uh, to be, um, allocate capital to the most important needs. You know, so um, I won't talk more about this now because we'll have the panelists tell us uh, about their views of it. So let me just introduce those panelists. Um, the first uh, person we have is Fan Gao. And uh, Fan Gao, um, please come up and, and sit here. Fangao joins us from Credit Ease, which is the largest peer-to-peer uh, -peer lender in China. Uh, she is the head of operational risk management and the chief compliance officer for the firm. She has been at Credit Ease for a number of years, and before that, 
Uh, she spent over a decade at Citibank, at uh, American Express, and at J.P. Morgan. Um, Fan Gao is, um, is a mathematician by training. She has a PhD in mathematics from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, and she is uh, going to tell us a little bit about how uh, Credit Ease works towards reducing the imbalance development in China that we actually talked about. Uh, this is the second panel discussion in a series that we've started this year. And the, the first one, some of you were here at the last one, the first one was focused on expanding the range of metrics from economic growth to environmental and social indicators in the regions and provinces and cities of China. And, and one of the themes we talked about in that was imbalanced development, and Fan Gao is, is, is something of an expert in that area. Our next panelist is Alex Lapel. Um, Alex is head of business development and impact investing at Neighborly. And uh, Alex didn't bring up his uh, backpack, but um, uh, actually, may, Ami, can I ask you to show us, sure. show everyone his backpack? Yeah, um, so he, he's got a cool backpack. And, 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 uh, uh, That's about it. <laughs> um, and it says that neighborly finances, schools, libraries, um, parks, and a um, couple of other really good things. But um, so uh, he's going to tell us more about Neighborly um, in a moment. Um, Alex uh, works for Neighborly, and uh, he's been featured in a number of advisory publications in the municipal finance space. Uh, he, I, I, you know, with all the panelists, I try to get some information from them to share with you to make them more human as they sit up on the dais here. Um, and Alex was able to tell me that uh, his favorite musician is Judah Akers from Judah and the Lion. Um, and I did listen to some of his, their music uh, over the weekend, and, and I highly recommend it. Um, so, but maybe he'll give us a rendition uh, towards the end of the panel. I don't have the chance to do that. Uh, after a glass of wine, maybe. Um, our third panelist is uh, Julia Marshkin, um, and Julia. Julia is uh, responsible for performing CSR evaluations for the global rating company, supply chain rating company, Ecovadis. And um, she's an expert on uh, ratings methodologies. And in particular, um, she knows very well the difficulties of translating information from many small companies that are vendors in the global supply chain for large brands uh, and making that information available in aggregated form to uh, acquirers and consumers. Uh, Julia is also an alum of the Sustainability Management Program, so we're especially honored to have her uh, back here. Um, before joining Ecovadis, uh, Julia worked at the Ontario Power Authority working on the first North American feed-in tariff. And I remember that when she was here, she also uh, worked at EDF, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and improved energy efficiency for Sony, um, Sony Studios. Um, and our fourth panelist is Ami Patel. Ami joins us from Elevar Equity Partners. Uh, Elevar is a global impact investing private equity firm focused on emerging markets. Um, she joined Elevar four years ago. Uh, I actually met her uh, before that when she was at Imprint Capital, which was an early um, uh, investment banker and advisory firm in the impact investing space. Uh, eventually, they got bought up by Goldman Sachs. Um, a much bigger uh, giant, um, and Ami eventually, uh, so she was at Goldman Sachs, and, and now she joined uh, um, 
Alevar. And um, Ami is an expert on emerging markets impact investing. She's uh, managed investments throughout the world, uh, both at Elevar, at, at Goldman Sachs, at Imprint, and also at Soros Economic Development Fund uh, in countries such as India, Palestine, Haiti, Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, South Africa, and Mozambique, and I'm sure I've left out some countries there. Um, uh, she is particularly um, good at thinking about the special challenges of investing in locales where the average income is very low. And um, we're going to talk to her a little bit about entrepreneurship, especially in low-income communities. Uh, she has an MBA from Georgetown. And um, I hear from good sources that uh, she likes to organize paint and dance parties for her two daughters. Um, so welcome to all our panelists. Um, Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to sit down with them now. And uh, uh, I have the easy job of asking a bunch of difficult questions and then grading them on their answers. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so I guess maybe the first question that I want to throw out to all of you. Um, in addition to maybe just telling us a little bit about uh, your company, particularly how does your company harness the wisdom of crowds? You know, how would you say in your own work, you know, to what extent are you aggregating measurement from thousands of sources, you know, whether it's vendors or investors or subcontractors or portfolio companies or customers? In what way do you see yourself gathering information and making that available through your decision-making process, either for yourself or for others? Feel free to jump in in, in any order you like. Sure, I'll, I'll kick that off. Uh, I think to start, it would probably be important background to answer who Neighborly is. So I would say the quick answer is that it's a technology platform that provides direct access to impact investment opportunities through the municipal bond market. So uh, we are a registered municipal broker dealer that works with both issuers and investors. And I think to answer that question, uh, we're focused on working with a variety of parties. So for us, what we're trying to accomplish as a firm is to bring the issuer, the local government that's bringing municipal bond uh, financings to market closer to the individual investor. So as a whole, uh, municipal bonds are mostly sold on the institutional level and then they're placed uh, to the individual investors after going through a variety of, of parties that sometimes take commission along the way. Uh, at Neighborly, we're trying to provide a voice to the individual investor that lives in that community. We firmly believe when it comes to infrastructure, the people affected most are the residents that actually live and work in the area, and those that live and work in an area aren't allowed to invest in that area. And we feel uh, municipal bonds are a great opportunity to do that. Uh, this is a sustainability panel. We feel that, you know, strongly that munis are the original impact investment, and that it's been around for hundreds of years and funded some of the most pivotal public projects. So for us, it's important to get information from both of our pod parties, not just the issuer, but the individual investor as well. So so on our platform, we have 20,000 retail users. And uh, when they sign up to our platform, they provide background on affinities, like what it is they want to invest in, rather than the issuer telling them what type of debt to, that it should come to market, it's driven more by the individual investor. And we feel like that's our clear differentiator as a company. Thank you, Alex. Um, sure. I'm from Credit Ease uh, in China. Uh, we are the first P2P platform in China and uh, by far the largest one. Um, so um, for us, um, the job is obviously very challenging because um, even for banks, um, there's not uh, a mature credit bureau in China, let alone to say a P2P platform. So we really have to gather information um, from the borrower. Um, and also, um, if it is small business, uh, we also look at their sales data, their inventory, um, a lot of um, other data. And, uh, and often the time, uh, we also um, use technology collect 
behavior data, for example. Um, for a platform like us, uh, fraudulent activity is a big deal. Um, it is actually the losses as much as credit loss. Um, one simple thing is um, how you type your um, ID in, in your cell phone, like your social security. Um, if you type it really fast, usually the chance for fraudulent activity is much lower. But if you copy paste or you hesitate, um, meaning that you're looking at something and type it in, um, the probability is much, much higher. Mm -hmm. So we use all kinds of uh, model to analyze uh, the behavioral data, um, the data we collect from um, uh, the central bank's um, credit bureau, which has only um, the traditional institute's uh, uh, credit data. We also exchange um, information from other platform, um, mainly to, to um, judge um, how much debt you're, um, you're having, um, whether you're just borrowing from us or you're borrowing from 10 other platforms. Um, so and using um, big data to analyze that. Um, it, we have been around for um, 12 years, actually. This month is our anniversary. And uh, it really helps. Um, it chi it's, uh, it China is, uh, is not as much, the financial service market is not as mature as the states. So, for example, average American carries five to ten credit cards. In China, it's about 0.3. So, there's a lot of underserving population. So, we do supplement uh, the traditional financial institute, um, whether to um, serve the person who would be rejected by traditional uh, financial institute or as a supplement to, to provide uh, capital and funding to small business or for their personal life. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Julia and I'm with Ecovadis and I think we are the only uh, company that is not directly in the financial industry here and the reason for that is because we provide sustainability data to stakeholders that might be interested in using this data to make their financial decisions. Um, originally, our company has been envisioned as a uh, supply chain rating company. That's what we do. That's the vast majority of our business. We help buyers make decisions based on their uh, supplier sustainability performance in addition to uh, a variety of other aspects that they're looking at. Um, but in addition to that, now we're starting more and more to focus on what this data can be used for, um, for other types of uh, decision makers. And I'm actually really happy to share today that very recently we've signed a contract with um, ING is a large Dutch bank that will be using our uh, rating in the, in the decision uh, in the decisions related to uh, interest rates uh, linked to their loans. And this is not the first time that uh, uh, sustainability and environmental data is linked to uh, lending decisions. <laughs> a lot of companies are doing that in a much larger scale. Um, but I think the uh, the interesting point and the uh, the unique point that we bring to the table is that um, the main focus of the companies that we rate, the, uh, the vast majority of our database that we've had today is comprised of SMEs rather than large public companies. So these are private companies that their information is not available out there. Um, so uh, our rating is unique in a sense that it can provide uh, data that is not otherwise available to these financial institutions and these fin financial players. Um, the way we harness data uh, from the crowds. I think it's, uh, it's a really great question to open this discussion because we really cannot do it all on our own, whether we're, in, uh, we're, whether we're doing peer-to-peer -peer lending or whether we're doing uh, municipal bond financing. Uh, we need to uh, rely on the players that are uh, experts in their, uh, in their fields to harness the information from other sources and to help um, enhance our rating. So we have partnerships with a number of uh, sustainability uh, 
rating and ranking companies. For example, we have a partnership with CDP, so the data, if the companies are reporting to CDP, uh, we, they will, uh, will be able to access this data as well. And we also, um, uh, we also take advantage of data in the public domain, so we, uh, we actually run our artificial intelligence engines that we developed internally to scan the web and to identify any risks that are related to companies that we rate um, in terms of their performance um, within their uh, scope of operation on environmental, social, uh, business ethics, uh, on their uh, behavior within these spheres. So that's in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. So we, Elevar Equity is a little bit different than the other panelists on the on the on the the, the floor. Um, we are a venture capital firm that has been investing for the last ten years. The thesis that we originally started off with was investing in low-income com communities in India and across Latin America to prove that this segment of the market was a viable commercially focused and financeable segment of the market. We started our investments in microfinance, providing small scale loans to group, groups and to individuals in these markets, both in rural and urban areas. And through the journey have realized that these are viable consumers that have aspirations and demands, and what is lacking is a democratization of access to basic products and services. And so the thesis of Elevar over the years has evolved into following this customer base, so whether it's an individual or their established small businesses, and figuring out what products and services can be delivered that are specifically tailored to solve the low-income population's problems to create more efficient access and high-quality and affordable um, products for this segment of the market. And so when we think about harnessing the wisdom of the crowds, over the last 10 years, we've touched over 20 million lives, and so that is the crowd base that we have access to. We follow this crowd. The team spends about 15% of their time on an annual basis in the fields, spending time with the customer base, asking them a lot of formal and informal questions, doing surveys, and it's the entire team. It's not just sort of the analysts on the team, but the partners as well. And it's through these conversations, very human-centered conversations, that you start to get a sense that the challenges they face are just in a slightly different dynamic than the challenges a middle-income or a higher-income consumer would face. But oftentimes, price of products are costly. It actually costs you more to be poor, to cash a check, to have access to a bank, to be able to go to a school, to have, you know, someone might sell you an insurance product, but the hospitals won't take your insurance or they won't accept you because you come from a certain socioeconomic background. So our mission and our thesis is to find business models where we can democratize this access while generating a financial return. Thank you, I mean, so actually that's an interesting jump off point for another question that I sort of asked you guys in different ways, which is that all the panelists here have a, a tough job of translating information and taking it a very long distance. So, you know, one of the provocative questions that I had for Ami was, you know, how, how do venture capitalists that uh, have offices in Sand Hill Road in, in uh, you know, outside San Francisco or in the Flatiron <coughs> District further downtown, these very high rent locations, how do they know what kinds of investments make sense? in uh, Kailitsha, in you know, one of the slums outside Cape Town or um, uh, you know, places outside Bangalore and so on. And uh, so you know, one of the things is that Ami, Ami's firm doesn't actually have offices in, in the Flatiron District, right? Yeah. I think you have offices <laughs> in, in, in Colombia, uh, in, in, in Bogota, in Bogota and, in and in Bangalore, right? So, so, so that's, that was sort of her response. And, Julia um, also has quite a long distance of translation because the global supply chains that we've gotten used to are very long and um, spaced out. Fan has to think about lenders who tend to be based in the coastal states of China and often they're lending to farmers in western 
uh, northern northwest uh, uh, China, rural China, where those farmers are unable to stay because of the pressures of migrant labor. Um, Alex, in many ways, is trying to subvert that process, right? He, he told us about how he wants to make it possible for somebody who knows their own community and the needs of that community to invest directly in it. So, you know, this is just a general question, uh, you know, for all of you. How do you think about translating information from sort of the, your furthest stakeholders? Um, how do you bring, you know, what are the languages you have to bridge? What are the, the socioeconomic spaces, the regional spaces? And how do you do, how do you address some of those challenges without it being too costly? I can start yeah. for us. So we raise investor capital. We take that capital and invest it into companies. And our team is responsible for being stewards of that capital and placing it into companies that serve our mission. The way that we think about recruiting talent for our team and to sort of align what our talented team will be able to do and be able to, to hit on this mission is we have a test. If you can't live in Kolkata, in the rural parts where there's frogs jumping out of a toilet for a week, <laughs> you can't be on the team. So that is the reality of the base of consumers that we are looking to serve and bring out of. And so there is a certain element of, of personal ethos that and drive that allows you to, to see uh, equity in the individuals that you're looking to partner with and to empower. And so when we think about the entrepreneurs that we're backing as well, we follow them into the field. So. Many of our entrepreneurs come with 15 to 20 years of professional experience, ex-city bankers, ex-Procter & Gamble. They come from the C-suite towers. And in a lot of these markets and emerging markets, when you have a nice, cushy job, adjusting to the lower income communities is, is pretty stark. And so if they can't make that adjustment, we don't go and back them. So we follow them into the field and we watch how they interact. And that goes back to this human-centered human component that we very much focus on. Because if you cannot see equity with those individuals, then you won't be able to know how to build a business model that thinks about them at the center and at the, for at the focus. And we can talk about a little bit later how we think about developing those kinds of business models. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Julia, do you want to jump in on the Sure. Images? Sure. Um, so similarly, understanding that the context of the supply chains that we rate is very, very diverse. It's from all over the world, and actually there is a predominance in certain parts of the world. Um, ever since the inception of our company, we knew that we really needed to have um, to have in-house language capabilities. and. Uh, we needed to build on this capacity to understand the local, not only understand and speak the local languages, but also understand the culture, which is very, very important when you work with uh, companies all over the world. So today, our platform operates in 10 languages. Our analysts speak over 20 languages. We have, um, we have nationalities from all over the world represented within our uh, within our teams and another thing that we are uh, trying to do to be closer to the uh, companies that we rate is that we we have o offices all over the world one of the latest additions to our um, office space was uh, we opened uh, a year and a half ago we opened an office in Hong Kong because we really needed representation in uh, in the Asian market Kid, and this was the right place for us to be because ultimately we needed we needed local analysts that understand the language, that understand the culture, and that are able to connect with suppliers that operate in uh, China and other parts parts of Asia uh, on a much uh, more local level. Um, so this is just in a nutshell in terms of the language capability, and of course the uh, our end product. We're trying to customize it to the market to help develop content, help support content that is. Uh, really uh, really close to where these suppliers operate. Yeah, um, I think that the best way to answer this for me was uh, thinking about why I joined Neighborly. So prior to 
uh, being at Neighborly, I was in institutional sales on Wall Street. Uh, I didn't like the value that I was providing and uh, heard about Neighborly through a friend who joined and I, I went and visited and did a lunch and learn. And the reason I was so intrigued, one was the name Neighborly. Uh, being Neighborly I think is really important, but it was such a diverse group of people from a ton of different backgrounds. And when you think about this space of impact investing, it can't just be a bunch of old white men representing what, what's most important here. It's, it's important to think about diversity and people coming from different areas to solve these really big global challenges. So I, I think we're v that's very core to who we are as a firm is that diversity and understanding all investors, not just Wall Street. So I would say that's, that's one. Uh, the second aspect that I think is important when you look at neighborly versus our competitors is is thinking about ratings so municipal bonds are given ratings by S&P's and Moody's and often there's small issuers underserved communities domestically that sometimes can't bring a deal to market with a rating because of the cost let's say they're bringing a, a million dollar fire truck improvement uh, it, if it cost three hundred thousand dollars to get a rating and involve all the parties they're not often able to do that and as a result uh, their investment and community struggles. We focus on the competitive side, the side that we drive the bids uh, on neighborly communities, communities that would have, uh, we'd have much more of an impact on than let's say Silicon Valley water. Uh, so that's I think really important. And then uh, the third aspect I'd say is education. So we're not just an institutional investment platform, we break down uh, very core initial uh, aspects of what is a municipal bond so the retail customer is very educated on what they're getting into what the tangible pieces are and what they should understand so I think all of those things allow us to answer that question Thanks. for me thank goodness I don't have language problems so for <laughs> <laughs> inclusive uh, for inclusive finance um, right now we're only doing it in China uh, but China has uh, 1.3, 1.4 billion population is the size um, bigger than Europe. Um, if you are really talking about the dialect, um, it could be um, as different as um, Russian to French. So it, it is um, to many parts of China, uh, the, the dialect I would not understand. Um, so for, for us, I think um, very similar to I Amir, mean, um, it is uh, the local knowledge. Um, what we do is online and offline. So you do have to um, partner with um, the on-the-ground troop. Um, similar to Alex, um, I was working on Wall Street for almost 20 years. Um, I was a Wall Street um, risk manager um, for life, actually, and that's what I saw. Um, and then <laughs> until Credit Ease uh, recruited me from Wall Street to China, um, one of the things they really moved me was uh, one of the uh, philanthropy uh, platform uh, Credit Ease was running. So uh, we, um, it called Yi Nong Dai. Uh, meaning um, um, to the benefit of the farmer. Um, it gave micro loans to farm women, and actually it's only giving to women, um, to farm women in the remote area in the west part of China, which is generally the poor area in China. Um, so we actually um, partner with uh, the local uh, women uh, organization. So they do know uh, what they do, what is the uh, situation for uh, for their family. For those women, they have no credit bureau information. They have nothing um, on, um, on the system. So mostly we do surveys, uh, we alter the question, and then we come back and uh, do the analysis. Um, and also we adjust the rate um, very often. Um, if you think about it, it, it is a philanthropy program. We don't make money on it. Um, the lenders actually have um, little to no, no return, uh, but you can give it out for free. Uh, because if you really give it out for free, uh, then somebody more powerful in the village will take it. Mm -hmm. It will never get into the women's hand. So what is the appropriate rate um, that you can help their life um, and uh, not and really use it? Um, and and we actually um, 
uh, really discourage uh, consumption on the loan. Um, it has to generate it has to generate income because um, migration worker is a big pressure as uh, Sadaji was mentioned in China. Often the time both parents has to leave their village to work in large metro area and it create a lot of social problem. Um, the, uh, their kids are given to the grandparents who are old um, and has um, very little ability um, to raise them, let alone about taking care of their education. Um, all kinds of harm to those kids, it's heartbreaking. So to keep the mother in the household has tremendous profound um, social impact. Um, so we gave out loans. Um, it's very small amount uh, in the US standard. You're talking about a couple of hundred dollar, at most a thousand dollar. But those women would use that to um, say um, run a noodle cart in the town or grow tea trees or do some craft. We're actually helping them selling their craft in large cities um, or uh, grow organic um, produce instead of um, like, um, the, like rice or wheat which are selling for a much lower price and we help them with their products. Um, and it, it, it's amazing and if any of you are interested to visit um, like the rural part, actually the poor rural part in China, it, it, the, the result is really amazing, but similar to your situation, the bathroom situation is <laughs> <it's> challenging. <laughs> Thank you, Fan. So, you know, it's very interesting actually that all four of you work in very different spaces, but there's a commonality to challenges. Um, what, one thing that I, I've asked you this before, but you know, is something about our research program. You know, one thing we do a lot is think about what's the range of metrics that's right to follow. You know, we've spent a lot of time working in situations where we have to displace a single metric that's put on a pedestal like GDP growth and, and think about environmental social uh, quality um, and at the Earth Institute uh, we're used to thinking about problems in systems rather than through the lens of a single objective so we often have this situation where, for example, um, instead of maximizing calories, we think about micronutrients, or instead of uh, maximizing the number of trees planted, we think about the range of species. Uh, so you know, in, in systems thinking, it's very common that if you follow a single metric, it leads to problems. If you just focus on return on common equity or quarterly EPS, then you stop paying attention to sources of longer term um, success, such as ESG or, or impact. So um, thinking about that, um, can you tell us a little bit in, in your work how you have to bring in other metrics? And I, you know, in some cases it seems that those metrics might not be quantitative because you guys talked about the human element. But maybe if you could just talk about what's a measure of success that you have to in a way subvert and look at other measures in order to do your work well. It's very hard for me to think about a single matrix for us. <laughs> I mean, uh, the financial ma metrics are important. If we don't make money, we'll stop uh, existing. So um, it is an important thing. On the other side, uh, we always put the social impact in front of the financial impact um, for us to help more people. It is inclusive financing. Um, to help more people in China has always been on top of our agenda. Uh, we do help, um, like we call, like micro business. They're really small, small business um, farmers. Um, because in China, uh, it's very easy for the U.S. farmer to get loan because you can mortgage the land, things like that. Um, in China, the land are technically state-owned, so you cannot mortgage that. So how 
to um, finance um, for um, things like your um, farming machinery to barns. Um, they, it's very hard for traditional banks and the financial institute to help them. So. Mm -hmm. Um, how to help more people on the other side um, maintain profitability for the platforms has been our constant challenge. Right. So, um, yeah, ESG is really important to uh, what we do at Neighborly when we think about how we try to set ourselves apart from other investment banks. Uh, we try to uh, integrate ESG analysis into the deals we bring into market. And the way we start with that is just an initial uh, assessment of do these deals map to the UN SDGs? That's a longer, uh, a longer term measurement, but that's, I would say, the first uh, screening pass that we use as a firm uh, when we're looking on how to address deals. Uh, so that's long term, and 2033 is obviously hard to measure for sometimes what's five and, and 10 year investments, but that keeps us, I would say, core to making sure that we're not just bringing any deal to market. Uh, because as a whole, municipal bonds, uh, I would say 90% of the proceeds go to fund pretty impactful projects. Uh, we don't want to just be uh, average in this space. We want to bring pretty impactful next generation deals to market. So outside of that assessment on the issuer side, we work directly with communities to try to drive the conversation to fund what we call next gen public projects. So two of those things that are really important to Neighborly and what we're trying to accomplish is solar microgrids and municipal broadband. We feel like those are two really impactful deals that can have uh, a really, uh, I would say, a long term impact on a community. Uh, not to say a park or a bridge isn't impactful, but we believe that uh, the, the creation of those deals could be impactful to all residents. Uh, so we believe that uh, you know the integration of those factors allows us to see a little bit differently and drive different conversations. Right, so for us, metrics are um, important and there are two sides to the coin here that I want to address. On the one hand, what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to have a uh, normalized score that will be a useful tool for companies that use this score to um, to start their decision making process. Ultimately, this is achieved by having a quantitative score. But to enhance this data, we actually have every company that we rate, we have a quantitative component of the scorecard and the qualitative component of the scorecard. And within the qualitative component of the scorecard, we're trying to highlight the strength of the performance of the company within the uh, sustainability, the ESG aspect of uh, its operations. So here we're, uh, we're signaling to the user of the information where are some of the strength of the company's operations and where there are room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And this we use as um, a conversation starter between the suppliers and the buyers because our ultimate, uh, our ultimate deliverable is a scorecard on a platform that is shared between the users of the platform. So if I'm, for example, I'm a buyer and I want to buy something from Amy and we've rated your company's performance, um, Amy and I can have a conversation about, you know, you're doing an incredible work on these elements of your company's performance, but on the other hand, maybe there is some room for improvement. Uh, and maybe it's not because um, of what your company is doing and where it operates, but more on the uh, aspects of where I want to take my company in terms of the goals that I have for the supply chain. So this is a tool that we, um, this is the platform that we create for the, uh, for the users of our solution to collaborate and enhance performance, but working together and in a mindful and very strategic way. So impact measurement is a really large component of the impact investing space and we are very proud of the framework that we've developed because our goal was to achieve both financial and impact in the same quadrant. So for us, you don't wake up one day thinking about impact and wake up one day thinking about financial. So you have to intertwine them and they need to be able to speak to one another. So the way that we approach it as venture investors is we think about 
three main metrics, a community metric that helps us stay focused. We obviously, our thesis is to target low income and underserved populations, but how deep can this business model go? So what percentage of the portfolio is to thin file customers? What percentage of the portfolio is to micro and small businesses with less than five employees? Very specifically identified targets to keep us honest about how deep that business model hits within the low income population. The next is a business model metric. Here, think of it as customer satisfaction. Are the customers coming back? Is what's the repeat loan ratio? Again, something very intertwined with your business model, your financial metrics, but really does relay that what you're developing and what you're building is being accepted and wanted and there's demand and continued demand in the market. And then the third metric is scale. And scale has a couple of different um, objectives. One is just the absolute number that we are able to reach over time. So how much are we achieving? And how much? How many individuals are we touching? How many businesses are we serving? But it also is what attracts the big, the big, big, the big investors to come, because once we've proven that this is a viable business market and this is a viable intervention with this consumer segment, you get the large private equity shops and the strategic buyers to come in and put in the fifty to hundred million dollars into these businesses and then build out brand names for this low-income consumer segment. So scale, if you cannot achieve scale in the markets that we're in, then you're not proving that this is sort of the next GE for lower income, right? Or more sustainable solutions. And alongside of this, we layer in ESG. And ESG is thinking about your environmental, social, and governance frameworks as a company. So we think about becoming a corporate citizen if we implant these philosophies and policies right from the very beginning and bring high quality global standard governance to our companies at this early stage, when they get to being five to 10 years old and brand names like a KKR or a TPG or a Bain come in, then inherently the ethos is built in a certain way and there's a natural defense to keep focused on this consumer segment and to stay true to the business model that was originally envisioned. And so that's the way that we think about impact and how to create that connectivity over the journey of the company. Well, thank you. So, uh, you know, from your conversations, I, I had some questions that came up. Um, and at the end, we'll open it up to the floor also, of course. Um, you know, one thing you all talked about is the the different the value of context we we worry about how much can be achieved through automation through following quantitative metrics you know we spend a lot of time uh, developing very um, clever metrics to measure all sorts of things fan I know studied uh, has a PhD in mathematics um, but there's a limit to what can be achieved through automation and metrics, right? And some of you hinted at, you know, the uh, the human element, the frogs jumping onto your bed in Kolkata. You know, I, I go to Kolkata a lot, actually, because my dad lives there. But I don't like to go anywhere where there are frogs <laughs> jumping out onto my bed. Um, so... Uh, and and fun. You talked about the different dialects and the context. So here's a question for you: In the ESG space, in finance, um, financial intermediaries talk about how impact investing or ESG or sustainable investing requires careful due diligence, right? To separate out the greenwashing from the from the real, and in order to do that, uh, it requires paying attention, having a large touch component. And that touch component, of course, is costly, because uh, often, uh, when, if there's not scale, as you say, then the, uh, you know, the, the returns aren't sufficiently large to support the, that due diligence aspect. Um, and so there's a pressure to invest in automation. There's a pressure to have relatively superficial metrics. Um, you know, there's certainly ratings providers that are 
uh, that don't go into the depth you know that uh, that Ecovadis goes in and uh, there's also an attempt to use AI to what extent do you feel these pressures you know the pressure of cost to reduce the amount of due diligence and monitoring and then the pressure to keep things authentic where do you see those kinds of trade-offs maybe you could tell us some stories well I think there's a balance I mean um, right to use um, AI um, to use model use um, artificial intelligence um, definitely cut the cost um, and you supplement that um, with um, judgment uh, often time mm -hmm. I mean um, this may be too technical but the models are overfitting so uh, you have to adjust it all the time and uh, what you do is you um, use uh, human judgment for that so there's always a fine balance between the two I don't see um, I don't see the pressure I don't see one way or the other it's um, it's always um, you have to um, both side has to work together so um, we do have judgmental review team uh, especially for a large amount of loans um, so there's on-site due diligence but for small amount of loans um, in most of it will be um, decided by automation so um, and you manage on the level of probability and the probability of default so you accept a level of default there yeah I would uh, agree with fan here um, I don't know if we get um, a ton of pressure to reduce cost um, but we do, and, and I think that there's a balance that exists. I think more than anything, we get, uh, when it comes to environmental and social governance factors, when we work with issuers, it, it's pressure to provide more reporting. I think as this space continues to grow, uh, it's clear that you know, there's, there's a lot of buzz around sustainability and ESG and impact, uh, but to go alongside that buzz, I think the reporting is really important. So in the muni space, one of the challenges with that is it's each sector is different, each municipality is different, and uh, e whoever's managing the money may look at it in a different fashion. So the reporting of those metrics in a timely fashion, whether they're quarterly or uh, readily available, I think is the most important challenge that we face. Uh, there's clearly growth in the interest of what we're doing, um, but there's pressure in oh, this is making X impact now report on this on a quarterly basis to show where my dollars have went and often issuers don't necessarily lead that charge uh, so we we get the most pressure uh, with that I mean, the pressure is definitely on all of us I think yeah. I mean finance is a highly regulated yeah. um, activity so um, th that's why scale is important uh, if you keep it too small the reporting, the compliance costs will take over. So, um, yeah, to keep uh, the scale there is important. So for us, um, just to give you a bit of a context, uh, to date we've rated over 40,000 companies ranging, ranging from uh, large multinational organizations to small mom and pop shops all over the world. Uh, we have a team, our analyst team is less than 200 people today and we've always been focused on looking for ways to combine human and technology elements in our rating to make sure that artificial intelligence does what it does best by scanning through large data sets identifying patterns and then identifying um, you know and flagging information to the human analyst which will be able in turn to really look at this data to look at this information and understand it in a much more meaningful way and put it in context of the company's activity um, we rate companies management systems so it's um, a highly qualitative plus 
quantitative analysis. So whatever machines are doing better, they're doing it for uh, within our methodology framework. But analysts in our um, in our li line of work will not be replaced by machines anytime soon because really the level of detail and nuance that is understood, and also you know working with companies from all over the world that have you know, management system documents and their own language that is not always, you know, typed up, it's not really a uh, an easy task. There, it requires a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, human deciphering. Yeah, no, no, I, I mean, it's a really challenging component. Yeah, I, it, one, I know that some of the companies in the ESG rating space now is focused on automated harvesting of information from websites, right, yeah. like um, natural language processing. So, uh, but what's interesting in my conversations with them is the, the companies tend to be perhaps very optimistic on what they can expect to learn in languages other than English. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's a level of automation of natural language processing around ESG information you could get from English websites, but when it comes to Chinese or Korean or Japanese um, or Bengali, you know, uh, it's going to be a lot harder to harvest that information. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're always looking for humans uh, because we have a lot of graduates who are, who are always interested <laughs> in working with you. Um, so we're we're sort of past the time, and I want to give um, a few minutes to the floor to ask any questions. Um, so thank you very much uh, for for being with us all this time. Uh, if there are questions from the floor, then we'll we'll take a few at this time. Do we have a mic? And just state your name and your affiliation when you ask your question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Malik Rashid. I used to work for uh, the Asian Development Bank. Now I'm an independent consultant here in New York. Um, ESG, uh, it's very interesting to me because you can never, from my experience, you can never have all three. You can have one, you can have two, but you can never have all three. That's right. And you're always in a position of making judgment calls. Um, you want to achieve the financial bottom line and the social and the environmental bottom lines, but it's hard to achieve all three. So in your respective um, lines of work, I was interested in understanding how this internal debate plays out. For us, we don't even try and spend a lot of time on the E because we invest in financial services companies and balance sheet based companies and so having an environmental footprint is minimal. And so in, in putting in recycling programs and those kinds of things in emerging markets are also very challenging. So our number one priority is G, which is governance and really trying to push the envelope on diversity and inclusion and bringing best global practices from a governance perspective and then we start to tackle the social, but the social comes with a lot of cost. And so for early stage companies, it's a staged process. And we familiarize con like ideas and policies, you know, like maternity leave and whistleblower and some of these other policies that you need, but someone has to write the policy, then they need to put it in place, and it's one thing to have a piece of paper and then another to actually implement it and train people and actually have all of your workers and your loan officers and your field agents on board. And so that is a costly endeavor and our companies just don't have enough cash to do that. Yeah, I think uh, we're lucky that we don't have to make these decisions. Uh, our um, our business model and our goal is to provide the information of availability of management systems around the uh, around the sustainability performance of a company to those stakeholders who are uh, in turn are uh, tasked with making the decisions there. What I would say is that it's really uh, revealing to see what kind of 
KPIs and metrics are important for certain sectors because we have buyers from uh, a range of different industries and you know for manufacturing for example they want to make sure that their supply chain has um, you know certain standard of certification and safety and environmental performance whereas uh, for companies that operate in financial services for example business ethics and corruption and bribery and again whistleblower procedures are very very important for the company in their supply chains so it's it, it's really uh, it's really interesting to see the diversity of the information that uh, our clients are looking for but what we're trying to do is make sure that they have the availability of data to select from and then engage with their supply chains on it I think that's a great question and something that we struggle with at Neighborly a lot. Um, governance, you would think, is the most important when you partner with a municipality. Uh, that is the least uh, readily available data. Um, there are some foundational pieces you can follow, like uh, uh, the good standing of a pension. Um, but without good governance, uh, you can't achieve your environmental and social goals. So we struggle constantly when working with issuers, uh, the lack of readily available available data. Um, it, it's just not frequently updated. Uh, a lot of issuers don't follow it. Um, so we struggle with that. So we focus more on aligning our clients um, investment with environmental and social factors and we hope to continue to drive the conversation on governance uh, but we're not quite there yet and we have a, a long way to go in, in, in our world. I mean, for us, um, the different business line may have slight different focus. Um, for the inclusive finance, um, we are more focused on the social impact. Uh, we do have another arm doing uh, wealth management and asset management uh, for wealthy Chinese. Um, for the asset management part, uh, we um, there is uh, a venture capital private equity arm, so they do heavily in, invest in the green energy, things like that, in, in, uh, environmental issues. Thank you. Any other questions from the crowd? I see a hand in the back there. Hi, my name is Michelle. I work at a smart city technology company called Ayaka, um, and I've done a little bit of sustainability reporting as well. So I guess my question to the panel is, do you see um, a future where some of the standards are combined and automated? So for example, um, I was talking about how it's difficult to measure all the environmental aspects of the cost of the Yeah, I agree. I would say no. Uh, I would love it if it, that were the case, but there's so many parties that exist that have to agree on, on data points, and that's where I think the greatest struggle exists for what we do. Yeah, well, the development institutions like ADP have been doing this for so long, and they can't, as like a global group of institutions at a state level, can't even agree on common standards. So I think it's instead of hoping and dreaming and spending a lot of time wanting to push the industry that way, I think people should just adjust their frameworks so that the lay person can understand them. Right. For us, I think we're very busy uh, doing work. <laughs> it's, hard. it's a hard ask. I would jump in and say that you know our research program was in a way founded um, to think about building a consensus around uh, especially the environmental metrics and we spent maybe three years and certainly many person hours um, collating the broad range of metrics you know we started out with more than a thousand different metrics that we brought down to about 300 and then um, taking out duplications and looking at uh, uh, consistency and so on and along the way there have been some other um, processes like the SASB framework and GRI and so on which I'm sure you're familiar with so there is a, a roadmap towards that I wouldn't say that it's happening too quickly uh, but we did we do have this dream that 
we would eventually have uh, sustainability accounting standards similar to the generally accepted accounting frameworks? I would say that in general what we see uh, when rating companies, it, it's really important to understand which standard would be meaningful and achievable for your company, which will make sense to your stakeholders and to your own operations, and then um, adjust that based on the context of the company's operations, it's really important to continue building consensus and continue developing these standards to push industries. But at the end of the day, companies are the ones on the ground implementing these standards. So they really need to identify where their risks lie, what their stakeholders are expect expecting from them internally and externally, and then come up with programs that make sense for them. And to a large extent, the, the work that all of you do is to make, to make clear to everybody what those differences are. Right? If, if everybody used exactly the same metrics and there was really one metric of environmental performance, then there would be no need for intermediation, for rating agencies, for investment management shops and so on. So part of what the finance sector does is to pass diverse information into decision relevant uh, signals. Um, and so, you know, that diversity is always going to be around. Um, we have time for one more question and then um, we, you know, we'll open it up for uh, cocktails and, uh, and food. Yes, there's a question in the back there, gentlemen with gray hair. Uh, my name is Thomas Ball. I'm an independent consultant here in New York. And thinking of the wisdom of crowds brings to mind James Sir Wecky's book from about 15 years ago. And he really championed the notion of prediction markets and decision making. I'm wondering the extent to which any of your organizations leverage that as, a, as an input or metric into um, decisions. That, that specific book or that specific methodology? I think he's thinking of, in general, um, prediction markets or uh, markets where you, know, um, you, where you have trading and we use the prices of instruments that trade as a way to... Prices of concepts and ideas. Prices of con you know, for example, uh, 10 years ago there was something called the Iowa electronic market where you would... Um, you basically bet on a piece of paper which would give you a dollar if Hillary Clinton won the election, or you'd bet on another piece of page paper that would give you a dollar if Trump won. And so based on the trading prices of those pieces of paper before the election, you would have some expectation. So, so that was one particular way in which the idea of harnessing the wisdom of crowds uh, might have been played. I, I think, you know, we had in mind that your work often involved aggregating information from many sources, not necessarily from trading, mm. but, but certainly feel free to jump in. I don't know if this is the right kind of example, but prior to the microfinance crisis in 2000, and I think it was nine or 10, um, we had a significant exposure to several microfinance institutions, but our crowd is our consumers. So again, spending time out in the field, it's gathering that data and you realize like an individual is over levering themselves and there's no collective set of communication at the top level for one lender to know that their borrower has borrowed from four other institutions. And there is a finite amount of that wallet for that individual that you know is limited. So you can start to see a bubble building in the market when you're close to the ground and you're not sort of sitting up at the macro level. And it's those micro level insights that definitely influence our investment strategy. So we halted all microfinance investing in the peak of microfinance investing before the crisis hit. 
and actually took money off the table and exited one of our better performing companies. And so there I think it is really just listening to your customer and then making deductions based on their habits because their habits are not going to change. As much as might go on the macro level, they're not. And so another instance was demonetization. The government of India decided one day that it was going to take 90% or 80% of the capital out in a day. No cash hits our economy directly. And the idea was, oh, they'll, they'll tr switch over to technology or start using sort of tech-enabled solutions. Within six months, it went back to being a cash economy. I mean, people are, we have habits. <laughs> it's like the worst thing about human nature. We just, that's just what we are. And so whatever you want to project at the high macro level, you still have to realize that that cash friction or these habits of the, of the consumers are always going to take um, priority. So that's how that's influenced us. Thank you. Anybody else want to take that question? Yeah, so uh, that's definitely something that's important uh, internally for Neighborly. Um, you know, when you think about an example like Flint, Michigan, there was never, a, it wasn't one big event. Uh, it was a bunch of very small, tiny governance issues along the way. So internally, when we're thinking about working with issuers, it, it's thinking about things that we hear from the ground, uh, really small data points that p people may overlook are really important to predict the future. Obviously, looking back now that you have the crystal ball, you can see a variety of, of bad governance decisions that that, that uh, <laughs> municipality made. Um, and we think that that's something that can be more prevalent in the future. We don't spend a ton of time um, bad-mouthing issuers because we're trying to win their business, but it's something that we are definitely thoughtful about uh, when we try to decide if we want to work with someone. So I think that's a, a very nice... There was one question here that she had her hand up like okay. four times. <laughs> so yeah. so I, why don't yeah. you go ahead and ask? Uh, sure. First, um, a comment because I was actually working at the UN Capital Development Fund, so in regards to the standards, um, not necessarily creating an accounting standards that's equal to the ones for um, GSAP, but um, there are things I've been hearing the grapevine that where they are trying to have some sort of framework set for the ever evolving impact investing industry. Um, <laughs> my question as a student graduating this May actually is um, as thankful and as um, grateful as I am to listen to what your companies all do um, in this broader aspect. Could you give more of like an actual like day to day, like what are current projects you're working on now? I mean, depending on how much you can disclose, but like what is that you're focusing on now um, in regards to the actual projects? So, so we, we just closed an investment in um, a school curriculum, school in the box solution. So in our third fund, we invested in a, in a company that provided loans to increase the, the infrastructure so that more students could be educated. So it would pay for benches, toilets, et cetera, to learn how to work within the school system, the affordable school system in India. And now we've invested in a company that will sell content curriculum assessments to improve the overall experience of students. So it's like one thing to give a student access, but then it's another thing to actually think about the curriculum and the content and the delivery of the education, and then being able to assess whether or not you're making an impact. So they're you know, sort of taking the conversation a little bit further and not just focusing on the, the output, but actually figuring out what a thesis of an outcome could be, which is ultimately making kids smarter. So I'll have a really brief, um, a really brief example. I think today uh, it's on a lot of companies' minds is how they're going to align their strategy with the SDGs. So what we're doing today is we're uh, working on a way to integrate SDGs and in the way we analyze companies' performance, sustainability performance, to help those, uh, to help large buyers to aggregate data from their supply chain in order to report um, on SDGs. So that's one of the projects that we're uh, working on today. Yeah, I'll share a little background on one project. Um, so this is the only public one that I could share. So next month, or 
I guess tomorrow's May. So in <laughs> May, <laughs> uh, we are working with the city of Somerville to bring a resident-only deal to market. It's going to be five hundred thousand dollars, restricted to only those who live in Somerville. Uh, they haven't announced the specifics of the deal, uh, but what makes that different from a typical municipal bond offering is there's it's very rarely to residents only so only those who live in Somerville can invest in Somerville um, additionally we're also breaking down denomination size average muni denominations 5,000 we're breaking down denomination size to a thousand to uh, I would say help democratize access to those that don't necessarily have five thousand dollars to invest so it's a great opportunity for those in Somerville to invest locally and we think it's going to be uh, Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. It's very hard for me to think about one project where a startup company was 42,000 employees. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I think one thing we're constantly doing is um, uh, market education um, to educate the Chinese market what is what credit is and to um, make. Um, the financing environment more and more favorable for business and also for the borrower. So I think uh, that's one thing we constantly do. Well, thank you very much. Uh